And he was always opposing very much to the equations and the comparisons. Uh, and the comparisons, indeed, I, I, I do want to have another, just an aside before that. The comparisons are so annoying, and this is another cause for fatigue. Uh, Saramago entered uh, Ramallah in 2002, and he was five hours in Ramallah, and then he said, this is Auschwitz. And uh, it was a very unfortunate, unfortunate uh, incident because he came with a delegation of writers, and we hoped very much that they would be able to give to talk sense to some Israelis at that time who refused to, to see what was happening. And when he said, this is Auschwitz, he just blew it all. Then I wrote a sentence for when I, did, when I reported about it, when I wrote, I wrote a sentence that my editors did, erased. I said, well, this is when he, it is Auschwitz when he enters Ramallah. What comparison will he have left, will be left for him when he goes tomorrow to Gaza? So this is uh, something about comparisons. But um, going back and ending with what my father said, he said, okay, with us, I know, we know it was extermination. It was five years, six years, but we knew it ended. It came to an end. But with the Palestinians, it is not ending. It is going on. It is 48 and it is uh, beyond. It is more and more. So. Who am I not to compare? Thank you. Okay. Um, that was very, uh, that was very profound, I think, both presentations. Um, I'm going to ask the questioners to ask a question one question, please, and please do make them questions. Um, so please go ahead, and I will say. Yeah. I was just wondering, so you said that Israeli armed forces will to exterminate. Do you think Israel is not committing genocide because they're held back by other forces in the world? Or, um, you know, because they're not that bad, and are they not that bad yet? But will they possibly become that bad? Why don't we take three or four? That's a very good idea. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, Professor Ashkar, you uh, mentioned the, con the idea of context, that we have to see things in context. No one here has mentioned, and by the way, I do deplore um, murder wherever it happens. Um, but what about the context that um, Israelis feel with um, possibly good cause that um, the Arab world or factions of the Arab world would like to push them into the sea? That's another context that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, this is a question to Professor Ashkar. I'm a, a scholar of the Second World War, and one of the <coughs> troubling aspects of what happened during the war, when you read the post-narrative arguments that we've heard discussed here, is the fact that the two Waffen SS divisions, the 13th and the 21st Waffen SS divisions formed in Yugoslavia, predominantly of Muslims, were mentored at times by the Grand Mufti in his exile. And I wonder how you sort of understand or have contextualize this in your book. Maybe one more question. Uh, my yeah, question, the, the, the war of narratives here mostly seems to be about an Ashkenazi or European Jewish experience and an Arab experience, but of course there's also the experience of Jews in the Middle East. I'm thinking of the Mizrahi. And there seems to be a war of narratives, or three multiple narratives. On the one hand, you have a narrative from an Arab side that these were people who were dupes of the Zionist movement and pawns. On the other hand, you have a Zionist narrative that they were victims of Arab anti-Semitism and persecution. And among the Israelis themselves, you seem to have many often conflicting narratives. And I wonder how the narrative of the Holocaust, which happened to European Jews, that fits into the large portion of the Israeli population that is of mid Middle Eastern Jewish origin. Let's stop there. 
speak into the mics. questions uh, were addressed to me. Uh, the context issue. Uh, the Israeli side, people are facing, uh, they are facing Arabs who want to throw them uh, into the sea. Well, uh, I mean, indeed, I mean, I think that uh, very much in consideration the fact that this has been implicated to the Israelis, that they are facing not only people want to throw them into the sea, but people want to commit a genocide. But what is the actual basis of that? I mean, this is just mythical. Because even, I mean, uh, Amin Hussein, for instance, if we take the, the, the Mufti, of course, had this attitude. His position was that all Jews who came to Palestine after 1917, that is after uh, the, the beginning of British domination of Palestine, should, uh, should go back to, to wherever they, they came from. And uh, when he came back to the Arab world after the Second World War, this is the, uh, the line that he wanted the Arab states to, to put forward. And he was not even I mean, listened to by the Arab states. And the Arab states, in 46, 47, the League of Arab States, which conducted the negotiations with the international commissions about Palestine, put forward a blueprint for a binational state with a proportional representation of all those Jews who lived in Palestine at that time. That's the reality. That's the, the, the real program that they were faced, uh, faced with. Uh, uh, and and the, the rest is, is uh, of course, I mean, you can find uh, people with extremist views uh, all the time. But the, the fact is that this depiction of, of uh, the enemy is represented, like the Nazification that I mentioned, as an argument to justify the unjustifiable an argument to justify ethnic cleansing. And we, we, we see it at its crudest in uh, uh, Benny Morris, the Israeli historian, famous, scandalous 2004 interview in Haaretz, where he, he said, uh, and you know, Benny Morris, probably most of you know, but it has been, uh, I mean, played a decisive role in establishing uh, on the Israeli side, uh, the, uh, the fact of the expulsion in 1948 and uh, knowledge even came okay, to that knowledge that there was a deliberate expulsion, even though with uh, some limitations that he put. And so in that uh, interview, he used openly the term ethnic cleansing to describe what happened in 1948. But then he justified this ethnic cleansing because he says, well, the alternative was genocide. That is, either we had committed this ethnic cleansing, or we would have been victims of genocide uh, 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 from, from the Arabs. And why so? Because Arabs and Muslims are barbarians, uh, their religion is genocidal, they should be put in cages, uh, and the rest. I mean, that, that was a really scandalous thing. But basically, this argument is there. This is the justification, this Nazification of the conflict is used as a justification, as a pretext to justify this continuous history of actual, not mythical, oppression, uprooting, ethnicity, and war crimes, crimes against humanity. And we can't be less critical than that, that the devout Jew and Zionist Judge Goldstone in his, in his report about, about Gaza. So this is, this is the, 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 the real thing. The uh, SS uh, units uh, in Bosnia uh, that uh, the, the Mufti uh, contributed to, to setting up, I mean, I, I deal with that in the book. And so, uh, I mean, any, anyhow, any form of collaboration with Nazism is reprehensible. But in this case, they were not at all instrumental in the genocide. They, they did not, uh, except very marginally, commit any anti Jewish exactions. And actually, those who joined these units. Uh, uh, did it because they were seeking, and that's what the Mufti himself gives us an explanation for his role in establishing these units. Not as something <coughs> or units uh, uh, dedicated to anti Jewish uh, causes, but as a shield or a way of shielding, uh, self defending the, the, the Bosnian Muslims from uh, uh, exactions by uh, Serbian fascist forces. And that, that's what he, uh, what, what he explains, although 
uh, in his memoirs and all that, he certainly does not pretend to be uh, a philo-Semite. I mean, uh, uh, his anti-Semitic discourse is quite open, but so, he, and he doesn't even pretend to, 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 to uh, that he, he wasn't aware about uh, the genocide and all that. But yet, here in this concrete case, that, that was what happened. Actually, one of, the, of those units is the only uh, unit in the history of the SS which uh, went into a mutiny. When they were sent out of area, of their area of, of the Balkans, uh, into France, and they went to the mutiny, and uh, many of them joined the partisan troops in the, the fight against uh, Nazism. So we have to here again to, to, to check the real <coughs> historical record, and also not forget that the only country in Europe where there were more Jews after the war than before the war is the only Muslim country in Europe, Albania. Yeah. The, the question why Israel does not commit genocide, I find it a very difficult, uh, almost obscene question to reply to. Uh, I don't think that these such questions should be asked with the same ease uh, to ask about uh, a certain date that something happened. Um, you know, by responding, it's like uh, collaborating with these obscenities. Maybe you misunderstood my question. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> What I asked was, could they possibly reach that point? And was it outside forces that were doing? I don't know why that's obscene. For me, I'm sorry, it's uh, um, I don't mean it that way. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, look, the fact is, let's, let's see the facts. The facts that you have... Uh, 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 that the Palestinian population grows inside, inside Israel, inside the Palestinian occupied territories. That uh, this is one of the things that I've learned when I was in Gaza and because I know Gaza. The problem of the blockade on Gaza is not about food, it's not about starvation. People are not being starved to death. Uh, the essence of Israeli policies today is to foil, I believe, to foil any possible solution, uh, fair solution, so that they can continue to keep Jewish hegemony in the region, uh, to prevent Palestinians from, from uh, exercising in a, in a fair way their, right, uh, their rights as a people with self-determination and in accordance with international, accordance with international resolutions and understanding. Uh, to prolong this as much as possible from 48, to, 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 to keep this as, as long as possible away from 48 when the memory fades, uh, so they think. Uh, they profit from the occupation, they profit from being there, but of course there is, uh, uh, I, would, I would say other things are more, other, other terrible things are, are uh, are possible, like uh, mass expulsions, uh, continuation, or what Benny Morris maybe wishes to have, to see, uh, transfer to Jordan. You hear you hear uh, Israeli leaders speaking now openly about this option of Jordan as the other Palestine, as the Palestinian state, and the two-state solution is Israel and and Jordan. This is the two true Israeli uh, two state solution. A few months, a few weeks ago, there was a pilot exercise in the, a simulation done by uh, Israeli military forces in, con in coordination. The military, prison authorities, uh, the, the, the police, and the um, Shabak simulating a situation where they'll have to have mass arrests of Palestinians uh, when, uh, in case there is a, a agreement 
implemented by the Israelis and the Palestinians, which involves the transfer of population. So in that case, so of course there are, there are scenarios that maybe 20 years ago and 10 years ago, most Israelis would, uh, would feel embarrassed or ashamed to raise. But I feel that when we raise a possibility, we make it a possibility. So that's why I say, no, we have to see what is, uh, what is in reality today. The reality, the urgency today is indeed to raise a voice. The urgency today is of expulsions. And Israel actually exercises many expulsions on a smaller scale. Where I see that the need, that the Bantu stance, the reality of Bantu stance that has been created over the past 20 years is actually a compromise. It is a compromise between a general will of the Israelis to transfer Palestinians from the country and an acknowledgement of the political reality that does not allow for such, now for such mass expulsion. And this is why the, the, the solution that the Israelis choose is to condense the Palestinians in the Bantustans. Gaza is one Bantustan, and then you have in the West Bank the, 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 those, those A and B enclaves that were created by Oslo and uh, with the uh, understanding of the Palestinians that this is all, only temporary and today they are totally helpless to fight against it. So this, I'm sorry that I said, but I... I uh, But yeah, I have now, yeah, I have now to admit that transfer is a possibility, a mass transfer is more, is more seeable and doable when you take Israeli forces than it was 20 years ago. Um, now as for the narrative, the Holocaust narrative in Israel, when, how it applies to uh, Mizrahi Jews or non-Ashkenazi Jews. First, there was a big segment of uh, Sfaradi Jews, my mother among them, uh, in Europe, but also in northern, uh, northern Africa, who were also victims and potential victims of the, of the Nazis. So this is something we should remember. But it's true that in Israel, uh, for many years, the, I could personally, I could detect among non-Ashkenazi Jews, or Jews from Arab countries and Muslim countries, also a, sort, a, a very similar Holocaust fatigue that you, you find among Palestinians. Because it was so abused and taken as, a, as a, one of the assets to pamper Ashkenazi Jews with their privileges in comparison to the uh, uh, non-Ashkenazi Jews, that there were similar reactions of uh, of undermining or, or, or uh, diluting in effect, trivializing, trivializing the, the experience of the Holocaust. I, I remember there was a demonstration uh, also, my father is a hero today, I see, and uh, here, but uh, also a demonstration in, uh, against uh, settlers killing a Palestinian girl in Gaza. I mean, then it was, it happened, once and then uh, we thought it is uh, it was the worst thing that could have could happen and one guy I remember it very clearly shouted at my father go back to Auschwitz and he was clearly a non-Ashkenazi Jew uh, okay this was also but now the, the propaganda is so that don't, nobody would dare to say now it is it has become a, a state religion of course the Holocaust so everybody is uh, abiding by the state religion. I want to say something <coughs> remark about the Mufti. There were, I just read at Haaretz a few months ago that there was a, a few dozens of Israel, of uh, Jewish uh, Jews in Finland who fought with the, not, uh, with the Finnish army, with the Germans against the Soviet army. Um, 
Finnish Jews, yes. And they fought because the Finns were at war, an independence war against, uh, against the, the Russians, against the Soviets. And the Allies were Germans, and they joined them. Uh, maybe this is another comparison. Two more questions. Just a question to uh, Ms. Haas. First, thank you so much for all the courageous work that you sent us from Israel. Um, the question is, a few, a few years ago, Professor Ilan Papi, who wrote The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, uh, seems that he was harassed. He was not fired, but he was harassed enough and threatened enough that he had to leave Israel and find work uh, in England. Now, it sounds also like there is an increase in the level of racism in Israel against Palestinians in the last few years, probably unprecedented. How do writers like you, progressive people who still have principles, who write all this work, and who actually collaborate sometimes with the Palestinians or do some solidarity work with the Palestinians. How do you survive in this atmosphere? Do you get harassed just like Professor Ilan Papi does, from officially or unofficially? <coughs> and what do you do personally, like psychologically, to live in this atmosphere? So I also have a few friends who are on the left in Israel who for the very first time say it's so poisonous, we've lost so many friends and family that we never believe, you know, that we're liberal and Labour Party supporters. And they're thinking about leaving Israel for the very first time, if you can say a few words. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> um, I appreciated your talks. And I, I think um, we've heard a lot of sort of comparing which uh, kind of racism um, is worse and murder versus colonialism and stuff. But is it maybe more important <coughs> to um, make a comparison and think about racism and maybe nationalism when it's on the part of, of the uh, weaker or more oppressed party as being harmful to any of those uh, ordinary people who are living in either situation because it seems to me what this racism or nationalism does is destroy people's ability to correctly analyze and fight back about their situation. I mean, in Israel, <coughs> you have a country that's really the pawn of America and big imperialists who could even drop it at some point, and Israel has created itself a situation of hatred, which leaves it at great risk of the whole country being destroyed. And you also have a country with tremendous differences of wealth and power where the, uh, those Israelis that are doing very badly uh, economically at this point are, are not looking at their society but are, are won over to this idea of blaming and hating Palestinians. And even within Palestine, you have, okay, you have great differentiations in wealth and power and you have the same problem of poor Palestinians being one more to nationalism than to thinking about what kind of society they need for themselves and even integrating themselves together for Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you. Um, a couple more. Yes, Jose. Right, um, a question to Professor Ashkar first. Raise the microphone. Okay. Right. Right. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Tariq Ramadan, he came earlier in the year to New York and um, he, uh, for the first time after he was allowed back in the, in the country and, and he was asked, he was being followed by, um, by a, a journalist from the New York magazine, uh, Robert Packer, um, and he was asked uh, specifically about the issue of uh, Hassan al-Banna and, uh, and his relations with, uh, with Amina Husseini um, and, um, and, and how, he, how Tariq Ramadan felt about that. Um, Tariq Ramadan answered in terms of Mm, the, that he had that the, that Hassan al and and, and I mean I was saying in terms of um, balance of powers, your friend of your enemy, uh, enemy of, of enemy of my enemy is, is, is your friend of my enemy is my enemy. Um, um, yeah, he said that, and, and that that was not satisfactory for him, um, uh, for for George Packer on, on, in, in in relation to to um, answering that issue. Uh, he, he felt that Tiger Malan wasn't ready to distance himself enough from uh, Hassan al-Banna and, 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 and from the, the Nazi regime. And to, uh, to Amira, I remember um, very clearly the, the, the um, issue with Saramago uh, that you mentioned earlier, and I remember your reaction to that. But I was wondering how you felt about um, you know, the fact that 
Right. I, you know, I, I wonder how you feel about the fact that, you know, in, in a way, that when that happened, I felt that we have so grown up with um, education about the Holocaust. And it's become such a, I think something that Professor Ashka has mentioned, it's become such a meter of, um, of evil and violence to, to all of us, Jews and non-Jews. Um, but it's just those sort of comparisons are inevitable. And I was just thinking of Najla Said's play um, earlier this year, the daughter of Edward Said, who mentions in her play about her, her father in his dying days when he was delirious, uh, saying that um, he, he suddenly started packing his bags. And his wife came up to him and said, what are you doing? And he says, I'm packing my bags because the Nazis are coming. Um, so it was so much in his subconscious as well of, of, of that sense of persecution and such a natural reaction. And I wonder what you, f you, what you feel about it. Um, one more, or one more, you Okay. Professor uh, Khalidi, will you talk to? Will I talk to? Yes, you Maybe said you were going to make remarks. I'll say a little bit. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, hi, thank you for, for being here. My question is more actually a reaction to uh, what Ms. House said about the obscenity of the comparisons that were made, actually, especially with the question about genocide versus transfer. Um, you know, there is there's a kind of thin line that, that separates between the two. I'm thinking specifically of the experience of the Palestinians in Sabra and Shatila who were passively genocide you know, with Israeli protection, could you say something about this? About how does this fit in this big picture? Because you transfer the Palestinians out into what? Into a world that does not want them. How is that different from killing them right there? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I thought we'll have time for one Yes, um, well, uh, uh, I don't know this, uh, the, the interview that was referred to of the uh, interview of Tariq uh, Ramadan, uh, but, uh, I mean, Hassan Banna is one thing, I mean, Hussein is another, even if Hassan Banna uh, considered, had a very high consideration for I mean, Hussein, and so did the Muslim Brotherhood as a movement including in space to the branch. Uh, but uh, they did not uh, collaborate in the majority, most majority sense of the term with Nazism, uh, whereas I mean, Hussein did. Uh, Hassan Banna had a record of uh, rather, I mean, a ambiguous record on his uh, attitude towards Nazism. There are uh, uh, contradictory statements he, he made that varied at various points. Uh, but uh, basically, they, they saw that I mean, their, their support uh, for, for the Mufti was, uh, on the one hand, as uh, someone sharing with them some uh, central and crucial element in their uh, ideology. And also, I should say, because it goes beyond the, 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 the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, at the level of Palestinian population, I don't deny in the book that uh, after 45, until 48, uh, the, 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 the Mufti still enjoyed uh, more popularity than any other uh, Palestinian leader among the Palestinians. But that's also mainly because of I mean, something that we have been in a recurrent, seen in a recurrent way, the demonization by those who oppress you. The demonization of somebody makes the somebody, makes you, you know, attach yourself even more to that somebody. I mean, we have seen this regularly. I mean, you can even see how, for instance, uh, the, I mean, huge difference uh, between Yasser Arafat, of course, and, uh, but I'm just giving, uh, explaining how, how the demonization of Yasser Arafat, for instance, uh, that, that uh, was, I mean, a crucial factor in, in his popularity, and how it went, his popularity went down uh, with a low ebb at the time of, of, of Janine, and then up again when he was uh, uh, put under kind of house arrest by, by Sharon in the Muqatta. So, I mean, this is, uh, it's a rather uh, easy to understand kind of phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, I mean, wh whatever was said about Hassan Banna, to speak here of the enemy, of, of his enemy, as an explanation for his attitude, might be acceptable for Hassan Banna. It certainly is not acceptable for, I mean, Hassan, because the crucial difference, as I said, is that he knew one about the, 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 the genocide. And secondly, this did not prevent him 
from uh, 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 I mean, uh, making speeches full of uh, Nazi-like anti-Semitism, uh, a description of the Jews of the, the, the worst anti-Semitic -Semi uh, kind from uh, uh, the uh, Nazi uh, propaganda outlets. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the, uh, speaking of Nazism, uh, it has, has been mentioned, I want to just to comment on that, uh, this issue of the comparison with Nazism. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, and I quote Michael Maris, the, the, one of the most famous uh, historians in Holocaust studies, uh, who says something very sensible. It, it, I mean, if people resort so much to comparison with Nazism, and as you know, it's not the preserved of Middle Eastern conflict. I mean, comparisons with Nazism, you find them, uh, you have found them uh, so many times uh, uh, since, I mean, over the decades since the Second World War. But that's because Nazism has become at the standard of evil. And in a sense, uh, this is actually, of course, healthier than uh, saying that Nazi, Nazism was nice or, uh, or, 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 or soft or, 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 or whatever. I mean, even Bernard Lewis who cannot be uh, suspected of any uh, pro-Palestinian sympathies. But said it's, it's better that they use Nazism as an insult than they say, uh, well, to bad that it did not finish the job or something like that. So we, we have also to take that into consideration. And, and finally, this issue of thin line be between genocide and transfer. Uh, I mean, what is the purpose of saying that? Is it a thin line for you to be expelled from your house or being killed? I mean, is this between the two? You see a, a thin line? I mean, this is, of course, I mean, uh, unacceptable uh, to say that it's a thin line. It's thin. No, there's a, a deep qualitative difference between a genocide and a mass expulsion. Both are crimes against humanity. What's the problem? It's not here. Ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity. Uh, uh, genocide is another crime, but it's a different scope. It's qualitatively different, and it, it serves no purpose to make such comparisons. The reality of Israeli oppression is bad enough to, I mean, as it stands, as it is in actuality, it doesn't need such, you know, uh, comparison, which actually, as Amira explained uh, very, very well, are a disservice to the cause of those who, who try to, to pronounce it. In the same way that Holocaust denial is, is I mean, the best service any Palestinian can do to, can do to Zionist propaganda is to in, uh, engage into anti-Semitic and Holocaust denial kind of, of statements. And I mean, uh, this, this has to be uh, uh, clearly understood and just see the, the uses made by uh, Zionist propaganda, your full outlets on the internet, and just monitoring uh, the whole Arab world and, and, and looking for every single expression uh, of this kind and just putting it on, on the internet. Uh, because of course it serves this Nazification of the enemy that I mentioned. About harassment, uh, of course the case of uh, Ilan is very known and very uh, annoying, but let's not forget that there are other scholars in Israel universities that uh, uh, voice as courageous opinions and are act very active against the occupation in, uh, uh, in many ways and being, are being arrested and uh, uh, because they participate in, day, in weekly demonstrations and other activities, and, and they remain. Uh, so they might be harassed, they might be bullied, uh, but they remain. And I still don't think that we Israeli Jews are facing many problems by being outspoken. Uh, in a way, this makes Israeli, how they call Israel, the people who understand that, that such a situation cannot last forever, it makes their responsibility very, very, very heavy. Because we don't face real, real danger by being, by opposing the occupation, by uh, opposing Israeli policies, by voicing uh, very uh, uh, dissident voices. It's not South Africa, it's not the Soviet Union uh, when it comes to dissidents. So I can write, in, in that sense, there is a democracy for Jews, for sure. 
which doesn't mean that the Palestinians are facing much, many more uh, dangers uh, today. Whether we shall also be a target sooner or later, I cannot tell, I don't know. Uh, but right now, I have to stress, it, is not, it doesn't need much courage. It needs a lot of anger, yes. But it doesn't need, it doesn't need, it doesn't need much courage to write in a paper, to, to go to a demonstration, to uh, uh, sign a petition. Even, even those Israeli actors who called, uh, who said they would not go and uh, act, perform in the settlement of Ariel, yes, they are, uh, they are brave, I would say, because they are endangering their, uh, they might endanger their salary, etc. But their, their life is not in danger. They are, uh, the society as a whole does not excommunicate them. So let's not, not exaggerate about uh, the difficulties that we Israelis, Israeli Jews face when we oppose the occupation. Um, <coughs> you know, Saramago could have used Gulag and could compare it to the Gulag. And he didn't, not because the Gulag is not such a uh, has not become such a, a meta concept as, the, as Auschwitz, but because he was a Stalinist communist and he would not compare to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think yes. <laughs> I think that's enough because we would like to. Let me just say it. Let me say a few words. Um, I, I think this event, uh, which is actually one of the first events of the Center for Palestinian Studies, that I forgot to say. Um, thank you all for coming. To all. <laughs> um, our first event was a cultural event. This is our first substantive event. Where we're, we're, I think the film is substantive. I think we're talking about some profound things, but. Um, this is a this is a more sober occasion, I think. Um, it to me raises the importance of context most most crucially. Um, the, the 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 book that Gilbert has written provides what's so often missing, or some of what's so often missing, in any understanding, for example, of the relationship between the Arabs and the Holocaust. Um, there is the most profound ignorance of the Arab world in so much of what is written about this conflict, especially by people whose focus is on Israel. Uh, and some Israelis, this is true, including some Israeli historians, including some good Israeli historians of the Arab world. And I, I, I would mention, for example, Benny Morris, who finds himself capable of pontificating about the Arab world without knowing a single word of Arabic without knowing this, the first thing about Arab history, culture, language, politics, religion. He is a, a total blank on these things. He's actually, a, in some ways, a very fine historian. He, more than any other individual, probably has helped to establish the historicity of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and he's published a new version of that book uh, that was originally published in the late 1980s with infinitely more detail, uh, with many of the same problems that the first book has. When he goes one inch over the line from his use of the Zionist and Israeli archives into saying anything about Arabs or the Arab world or Arab history, it's a black hole in which he has absolutely no light. He knows nothing. He is pathetically ignorant of this topic. So much of the writing on this subject, from the first book, The Mufti and the Fuhrer by Joseph Sechman, who was a, a provisionist Zionist who started this wave that your book talks about, of this narrative, is written by people who haven't been you know, completely innocent of a knowledge of the Arab world. Uh, and this is a beginning, an understanding of, Arab, of modern forms of Arab, Arab anti-Semitism, and modern forms of Arab Holocaust denial, and modern forms of Arab relations to the Holocaust based on a profound understanding of a knowledge of the Arab world, the Arab politics, Arab political discourse. There's another quite brilliant book by uh, Israel uh, Gershoni and, and, and James Jankowski about fascism in Egypt. Anybody who dares to talk about Tariq Ramadan and Hassan al-Banna has no business opening their mouth without reading that book. 
because an understanding of the colonial context in which the Muslim Brotherhood arose and, and Hassan Banda's relationship, distant though it was to Nazism, uh, can't possibly, cannot possibly um, uh, be, be taken seriously without a profound understanding of that context. So these are books that put these things in context. This is not just true for understanding uh, uh, Arab expressions about or Arab relations to the Holocaust. This is just as true about understanding Palestinian and Arab history. You cannot understand these things. I, I think you can't understand Palestinian history without understanding the entire course of modern Jewish history. You, you're, you're, at, you're at sea if you don't understand how, not just how the Holocaust may have been manipulated, but how the Holocaust is understood and internalized by the American Jewish community, by the European Jewish communities that survived the extinction, and by Israeli Jews. If you don't understand that, you understand nothing. You can't understand how these groups, these polities, these societies related to Palestine and the Palestinians. You can't understand Palestinian history if you don't understand the fact that before the Nazis came to power, the Zionist project looked like it was failing. Emigration from Palestine from 1929 to 1933 was greater than emigration to Palestine. The proportion of Jews in the population of Palestine declined from 1929 to 1933. Zionist leaders looked at one another and said, this project may not succeed. Under 18% of the population was Jewish. How could you turn Palestine into a country that is as Jewish as England was English? From 1933 until 1939, the population ratios changed. The ownership of the means of production in Palestine changed from minority ownership to majority ownership from 17% to 35%. And, and, and the people who were, who were forced to flee Europe and who escaped with their lives and, and with their uh, human capital and with a little bit of their, of their capital, the very fortunate few who were not exterminated during the Holocaust, completely changed the balance of power in Palestine. You don't understand that, you don't understand Palestinian history. You know nothing, if you're an Arab or Palestinian, about this history that's supposedly important to you. You have to understand those things. And you have to understand the impact of those things in terms of changing the way in which the American Jewish community related to Zionism, the way Europeans related to Zionism. If you don't understand the Holocaust, you don't understand Zionism. Uh, not, not only is material success fundamental in Palestine, but how people's views of this, this ideology as a solution or the solution to the Jewish question changes the moment Hitler comes to power. Uh, all of these things, I think, are, are, are drawn up, are, are underlined, I think, by what we've heard here tonight. I, I could talk a little more about some of these things. We, we talk about the Mufti's contribution to the Nazi war effort, his mentoring of the two Bosnian divisions of the Waffen-SS. We talk about his collaborators, the, the, the people who escaped to Germany from Iraq via Tehran just after the Rashid Ali coup in Iraq. Uh, but what we don't talk about is the Arab contribution to the Allied war effort. The city of Marseille was liberated by a Moroccan and an Algerian rifle division, two divisions. They lost 5,000 men in a week. 5,000 Algerian and Moroccan soldiers died liberating the city of Marseille from the largest port in south, south of France, vital to the Allied war effort. Nobody talks about the hundreds of thousands of Moroccans and Algerians who were drafted into the French army and fought heroically to liberate Europe. Nobody talks about the Arab Legion. Nobody talks about the tens of thousands of Egyptian soldiers who were conscripted and served as labor battalions uh, 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 under, under uh, Montgomery and other British commanders. Hundreds of thousands of Arabs helped the Allies win the war. So you have the Mufti and you have dozens of divisions of Arab soldiers admittedly conscripted into colonial armies, forcibly uh, taken off to Europe. Uh, in, in fact, two wars. This happened in World War I as well, uh, just as it happened in World War II. The dozens, the hundreds, the scores of politicians who aligned themselves for craven reasons, for other reasons, with the British. Uh, the Mufti, uh, I talk about this a little bit in, in The Iron Cage, the book that was just translated into Hebrew. Um, the Mufti was opposed by the bulk of the Palestinian leadership in many of his positions in the late 30s over the white paper, over a number of other things. Nobody talks about this. He was the paramount leader. It's absolutely accurate to describe this man uh, as having been the most important single Palestinian leader, at least until 1948. Uh, it's also, it's interesting, however, to see where other Palestinian, where other Arab leaders were, not just to look as Jim did 
importantly, I think, at where the Arab states came out on the issue of a Jewish state uh, or, 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 or the continued existence of Jews in Palestine. But to look at what happens to the Mufti after 1948, he disappears. If this man is as important as he's made out to be, then why is he not the same kind of figure after 1948 as he is before 1948? It's, it's, it's something that's, that's missing in the historiography. I don't really touch on this as I, as I might have in, in the Iron Cage. Gilbert actually talks about some of these aspects much more than I do. Um, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, I hope you'll attend other events. I want you to join me in thanking two people who I think have spoken very much from the heart of the <laughs>